Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and I'm going to be presenting material pertaining to chapters 9 and 10. This is indeed a very critical chapter because it deals with uh, finance and monetary policy. And although we've been talking a lot about trade, we've been talking about international flows of resources, we've been talking about employing resources, all the different economic and trade theories that were postulated so that countries can use it to make best use of their resources. We've talked about the impact of certain factors in, in terms of trade, and we saw a very practical example because we're now facing a worldwide pandemic most notably the coronavirus, which many of you uh, have seen in the news. And we actually had some articles in our last journal day that talked about the coronavirus in great detail. And so I want you all to make sure that you take the precautions as you go on spring break to ensure that you stay healthy and safe. So you saw that I did post a, a Blackboard message about the coronavirus and some of the precautions that were listed uh, from the FAMU uh, website. Uh, we received messages about the um, regulations uh, in terms of the, the measures that uh, will be taken. And I also posted a new calendar, an adjusted calendar because we've kind of made some changes. We've missed a class. We had a, a cancellation back in February of a class due to a, a coming, a pending storm. And uh, I also pushed back uh, an exam. So we're going to make some adjustments. And so our next exam will cover only two chapters, nine and 10. And that will be at the end of the month, as you can see, on March the 31st. And on this Tuesday, we will continue in Chapter 9. We will have our journal articles on Thursday. These journal articles are different in that the, art, the subject of the articles will be the countries that the groups have selected. So if your group has selected a country and you're doing your journal that third, the third day, the third journal day that we have, then you're doing your journal on that country. Uh, and it's just as simple as that. And you can choose a topic of any nature, just as long as it's about that country. And obviously, it has to be a substantive uh, article. You'll probably come across uh, a lot of articles about the coronavirus, but you don't have to limit yourself uh, to the coronavirus. It can be on any, any topic. It can be politics, finance, economics, entertainment, uh, or it can be health. You know, that's certainly a, a current uh, and trending topic. Okay, so we're going to have our spring break. And um, I have a quiz that uh, we're going to do. And then uh, when we come back, you'll submit that quiz. We'll have a review of chapter 10. And then we'll take our third exam. Now, let me say something about the third exam before I go to the material, which has been pre recorded. But the third exam is a, a very important exam, and you want to make sure that you apply yourself. As I know that some of you have gotten messages from me through Blackboard about class demeanor, being inattentive on your cell phone, and I'll send you a quiet note. This is a time that you really have to focus because we've gone through a few things last Thursday in terms of understanding how this whole currency thing works. 
is not necessarily the most intuitive concept. So you're going to have to kind of stretch your thinking just a little bit as we talk about transactions and the impact of external factors as it relates to these transactions. Exchanging currency and what happens when it depreciates, what happens when it appreciates, uh, how you hedge your losses to avoid currency exposure. All of these things are really uh, important. When we come back from the break, you will submit your quiz. We will finish chapter nine, and then we will prepare for our exam, which is on that following Tuesday, on the 31st, just on two chapters. That should be enough. Uh, you will be doing a lot of calculations, and you will have to really focus. Again, I joked that this is, I consider this my high-low exam because typically the exam scores are either very high or very low. So you don't want to be on the low end because now we're getting toward the end. This is your third exam and you want to make sure you start finishing strong. Make a, uh, a valiant effort to get the grade that it is, uh, you know, that you're looking for. We will have our presentations. I'm looking mid-April, so we have approximately uh, a month to get this done. And if we need, need to move this, the presentations, then uh, we have another week to do that. But it will push the exam back into finals week on Friday, uh, which means that uh, it's... Um, it may create uh, some some issues, and it typically does create issues for me because I have to process the exams, uh, and the testing center is not open on the weekend. So then I'm at, at a very, very um, um, you know critical crunch in terms of time. But be that as it may, this is uh, where we're going, and so I want you to work diligently in your groups. I have provided the handout some time ago about the project. So some of you have come up to me and asked me, what are we supposed to be doing? Although I passed this handout and it explains the, um, the process in terms of what it is we're doing. Uh, what you will be doing is collecting this preliminary analysis. And this preliminary analysis will give you an understanding of the country that you're doing. So you will look at things such as the background of the country, the geographic setting in terms of where that country is located, because, of course, geography is very important. The uncontrollables, which is perhaps the most important part of your research, is to understand the environment that you're going into. So the political legal environment is going to be important because it sets the stage for what you can and cannot do as a business. Your econ economic and financial environment will also be important. Culture will be extremely important, especially if you have products that are more sensitive to local taste. Physical environment, which is uh, obviously the layout of the land, the climate, all the things that may impact the distribution of the product than also technological and human resource environment. So you will be looking at collecting that preliminary data. And then after you complete that data, you will then choose a product. And that product will be adapted, given the variables that you have researched, you will take that product, adapt it, so that it can succeed in that market. And then that you will present that um, you will, you will do a presentation on that product, and you will give us uh, kind of an overview of how you came to that uh, those decisions. Uh, it is similar to what we're doing, uh, what we did with cheeseless Cheetos. So if you can just keep that in mind, that's where we're going. All right, uh, you have all of your you should know the groups that you're in. I have posted the rosters. And uh, if you did not 
have a chance to meet in your groups yet. You will get an opportunity, but I would imagine that you have ways via GroupMe to contact people uh, who are in your group, but we will have times where we'll uh, take to, uh, to meet in your group, perhaps 10, 10 minutes or so at the end of class. Uh, I will also have meetings with the group leaders just as a way to keep track of how things are going in the group. So those of you who are selected or volunteer to be the group leader, it's not going to be uh, a major uh, commitment of time as far as what you have to do with me. But of course, you have to lead the group and make sure that everybody stays on task. All right. So that is uh, all that I'm going to say. I'm going to make way for the material in chapters 9 and 10. Again, there is a video toward the end of this video, this, this instructional video, and it deals with currency speculation. And I hope that you uh, take an interest in it. Although the video is some years old, uh, I also have videos that show how things are done today. And it's similar, except the equipment is different, but it's still the same process. And you just have a few more tools uh, to, to, to make these uh, transactions, these currency transactions. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, make sure that you send me an email and I will make sure that I get uh, a good turnaround time. Uh, and I'll keep you posted on any developments as far as classes are concerned or any university announcements uh, and any changes that will be made to, to our classes. But other than that, I think um, uh, we're on a, a course uh, looking toward the end of the semester. Um, so let's stay focused and um, let's finish strong. And um, I'll see you on Tuesday. is I will begin this review starting with chapter 9 and I'll first begin talking about debt and equity. This is information that you can read and you can get a pretty good understanding uh, of it. it. It's not it's not dealing with formulas or anything technical so you should be able to take it as it uh, as it is. So this capital market and when we talk about capital, we're talking about something of value. We're talking about an asset. And an asset does not always have to be physical. Uh, when we talk about assets, we're talking about perhaps finance. We may be talking about a machine. We may be talking about intellectual capital, which of course is not tangible but is something of worth. Uh, all of us have gone through a process, an educational process, where we are accumulating or building up our intellectual capital. And that intellectual capital is hopefully going to put us in a position to either gain a particular uh, salary that we're looking for uh, or allow us to get into a position where we want to start our own uh, enterprise. So capital is what's really important, especially in a country like the one that we live in that's, um, that kind of runs on this uh, whole concept of uh, the, the value of capital and the movement of capital as well. So capital is defined as, or capital market is defined as a system that allocates financial resources in the form of debt and equity according to their most efficient uses. And we talked about debt briefly uh, in class, and I think we all know what debt is, and hopefully you don't have too much of it. But not all debt is bad. Now, debt is obviously something that is owed to those who borrow those funds. And we want to leverage that debt, meaning that whatever debt that we take on, we want to 
turn that into something of value. So if you take out a student loan, ultimately you want to turn that loan into intellectual capital. So that intellectual capital will afford you the opportunity to put your skills on the market. And those who are suitors of your skills will pay you for that intellectual capital. So student loan debt is actually a pretty good debt. There, there's other types of debt. Obviously, there's debt if you buy real estate, or you pay a mortgage, or if you buy a car, it's a car note. If you use credit cards, then you, you have credit card debt, which is a type of debt that you don't want to, to get too much of. Uh, it's, it's not the best type of debt, but the value proposition of credit card debt is it's very convenient, and it offers you the ability to get something, get some merchandise without having to pay for it now. But there is a cost that goes into the payment, which is called interest. And I believe you all know how that works. And one of the ways that banks make money is that if they give you a loan, they charge a particular amount of interest. And that interest accrues over a period of time after which you owe the principal and the interest which is added to it. Now for credit cards you may pay a minimum but you don't want to um, you don't want to uh, stretch that out over a long period of time in terms of paying something back, paying a debt back because over a period of time that interest that you've paid back will have more than paid for the product or service that was that was um, uh, that was rendered. So that's that's the whole catch with when you talk about debt is that you want to stay on top of it so that the fees do not uh, basically outstrip the value of what you uh, purchased. It's not really a good idea uh, when you talk about eating out a lot and putting, uh, charging everything on a credit card. Just imagine you, you have purchased your groceries and things that you need on a credit card and you've eaten it let's say within a week but then your bill comes at the end of the month but then you have to pay for that you're having to pay for something that you've already used whether it's a hamburger you know or a fancy dinner or whatever you have consumed you're paying interest on something that you have already eaten You've already gotten the value out of it, but you're still paying for it months after you've consumed it. Now, that's typically not a good way to, to leverage a debt. Uh, generally, it's going to be for things that you cannot pay for uh, and not things that you would normally pay for in cash. Now, there are different types of debt. Now, I talked about the various types of debt. There's There are also bonds which are, are issued by governments, they're issued by companies, and essentially it's a way, it's a way to raise uh, capital, it's a way to raise money. Uh, some years back, a couple of years back, Greece, which was in trouble economically, were issuing bonds. They were selling government bonds to those who wanted to um, take a chance on the hope that Greece economy would turn around and once that bond matures then Greece would then be responsible for the accrued interest and the face value of of that that bond so it's a way of raising capital uh, and it's uh, obviously a, a debt that the issuer of that bond owes you at the time of, of maturity then there's equity equity is uh, basically ownership and if you buy a house I mentioned in class that if you don't pay for it in full then you're the part owner of that property you may have paid 20 percent a down payment on that property you take the rest out in a loan the bank holds the property until you have completed payment for that property. Each time you pay 
on that property or pay your mortgage every month, you're increasing your ownership or equity in that property. And the same thing goes with uh, stocks that you may buy. If you buy shares in the company, you are a part owner, uh, which is why if you are a shareholder, uh, you get to vote on uh, perhaps the direction of the company in the shareholders meeting. Uh, you can determine perhaps um, whether the CEO is doing a good job or not, and the board of directors can actually remove that CEO. And the shareholders uh, have some influence in terms of the direction of the company because they are the, the ones that are part owners or have invested uh, in, that, in that entity. So this is a, a photo that I took at the Makati Stock Exchange in Manila, Philippines. And as you can see, this is actually on the floor and you see the currency quotes uh, listed there. That was up January 11th, 2016. I was there a couple of years ago. So one of the other things about capital markets is you have the, the, the idea of capital movements, as I said before, and it is important for capital to continue to move. The more that capital moves, the stronger it gets. And you have this capital leverage. I mentioned that if you deposit your money into a bank, that money doesn't sit there. Even though you're accruing interest, they pay you interest for that money, that interest that they pay you is basically a fee that they're paying to use your money. How do they use your money? Well, they lend it out. They lend it out to small businesses. They lend it out to those who want home improvement loans. They lend it out to uh, others that need uh, small loans. And of course, depending on the entity, will determine the, the interest that's assessed to that uh, the loan that they're giving out. But you can be certain that the interest that they are charging for the deposits that they're lending out is uh, it's going to be higher than what they're paying you. There's going to be a difference in the interest that they pay out versus the interest that they're receiving for the money that they're lending out, which is actually your money. And um, that's just the nature of, of, of banking. So as you can see here, I have on the screen President Obama. When he was campaigning for the uh, office of the presidency, he talked about this idea of companies moving their capital overseas to avoid taxes. And this is what you call a tax haven, and there are a number of different tax havens around the world that provide uh, a lot of services because of the low regulations that they have. So some of these are listed in the book, and there are uh, different countries uh, like the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, uh, Luxembourg, Singapore. Gibraltar, Monaco, some of these places you've never even heard of. So Gibraltar is in, in Spain. It's uh, on the tip of Spain, going over the Gibraltar Strait. Uh, Monaco is um, kind of a very small and very prosperous um, country that's situated in Europe. I believe it's situated next to um, um, France. It's kind of nestled in between a um, couple of countries. And also some of the, the uh, British Isles, there are some uh, tax shelters there, not to mention the Swiss banks that you may have heard of. So President Obama actually passed the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. And I'll just show you um, what that is. So this is from the IRS website, and it talks about the foreign account tax compliance act 
And it says it generally requires that foreign financial institutions and certain other non-financial foreign entities report on the foreign assets held by their U.S. account holders or be subject to withholding on withholdable payments. So essentially, this is a way to ensure that those companies that are moving accounts or moving um, their capital overseas uh, are subject to some review and also taxation. So this was something that uh, obviously made uh, some uh, upset at the fact that this uh, act was passed, but uh, this was something that uh, President Obama had campaigned on. It just so happens, I read this article recently, it's, it was out, been out two years, but it says that the United States is actually a, uh, a tax haven as well. And it didn't occur to me, but if you look at your, your credit card companies and, and you look at some of the statements you get in the mail and you'll notice where these banks are situated. So you'll see places like South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Delaware is a, is a big one. And it may not have dawned on you why these companies were setting up their, their, uh, uh, their, their, um, they were setting up their companies in these states, where these states apparently have very liberal tax laws. And they are often used not only by uh, U.S. companies, but also by international companies because of the liberal uh, uh, tax structure that they have. Again, bond markets, international bond markets, um, you as an individual are able to invest and buy government bonds. You're able to buy corporate bonds of foreign companies. Uh, you're able to use uh, this idea of uh, interest arbitrage where you use an interest, um, you, you take out a loan here, and it's the same situation that the bank uses, or the same technique that the bank uses, that you would get a, a loan here, and say it's 4% interest. And what you would do is then you would buy a foreign security that with that money, that will give you a higher rate of interest. And so you're basically leveraging the, uh, uh, the differential in between the, the, the two markets. The equity market involves many different activities, including privatization, which we heard about in Life and Debt, which means that certain time, at, at certain times, governments will open up uh, public publicly run industries to uh, private investment so that that capital flows in. So for example, if there's a government owned industry, government run industry, that industry can be opened up to investors, to entrepreneurs, and then that money will then flow in for a piece of that, um, that, that uh, industry. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the postal service being privatized, run by, uh, being run by private companies, but that remains to be seen, but there are a lot of in industries that have have been privatized, and particularly when you go to foreign markets and phone companies, the have moved into a lot of countries where the government previously run the phone the the phone uh, infrastructure, and they issued uh, these phone lines, and it was it was very inefficient uh, because the government really isn't in the business or have the capability to run that type of operation. So privatization is a kind of a natural step for a lot of countries to become more efficient. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, I could talk about this whole idea of bitcoins and cyber markets that they mentioned here. Uh, that is uh, something that has, has not really been uh, stable. You may have heard about it, uh, these cryptocurrencies. I think we had a journal article that was done on that. Uh, but that is something that you should keep your eye on because it's, um, uh, it's a market that is uh, developing as we move into more 
uh, virtual payments and digital currencies and e-payments. And I think it, it will uh, be something that will catch on in the future. Okay, so this is the chart that you will recognize because you used it for your quiz, take-home quiz. And on the left, I have some terms some of which you may be familiar with, but there's a couple that you may not know of. The bid-ask spread is the idea that you have a differential between currency values in different markets. So logically, if you're buying currencies in one market at one rate, you want to be able to sell them in another market for a differential and hopefully that differential will be of a greater value so then you're able to make um, that profit. Uh, at the end of this segment we'll actually see a video of a live transaction taking place at Barclays Bank and it's on the foreign exchange floor and they're buying massive amounts of currency with the idea that they will find a spread and be able to move those uh, currency uh, amounts in different markets. You have the currency pair. So in Forex jargon, you have two currencies that, that are exchanged or that are being related to one another. In this currency pair, you have USD slash BRL. Well, what is BRL? BRL is Brazilian Hei, which is how it's pronounced in Portuguese, or in English it would be Real, R-E-A-L. Now, these acronyms come from a, there, there's a whole list of acronyms that um, you have for foreign exchange. And I want to just uh, show you these acronyms uh, very quickly. If you look here, and I think I showed them in class, but if you look here, you have all these acronyms, currency acronyms. And some of these you may not have heard of, like you have the CFA franc here. That's used in French-speaking African nations, the CFA franc. There you have the Cuba has two currencies. They have one for the tourist, which is a kook, the convertible peso, and then they have one for the locals. And I understand they're going to be doing away with um, with the two currencies and just have the one. Here you have the euro. And notice, if we go down to Ger Germany, this was the former name of the German currency, the mark. They no longer issue the mark. They have the euro, but they still keep DMK, the symbol of the old currency, to distinguish the countries that are within the euro block. So again, you have a lot of different currencies, some with some very creative names. Myanmar Kayat. Very interesting. But this gives you an idea of the amount of currencies that are out there in the market not all of these are traded. Some of these are not convertible because there is a lack of confidence on of those currencies on the market. So that's the uh, the one uh, issue with with currencies is is you want to stick to the ones that are considered the hard harder currencies. There's also something called a basis point. When we talk about movements of currency. Um, when I talked about traders moving currencies in and out, those currencies have a particular value when they're purchased. Traders, when they look for these differentials, they look for movements of basis points. Now, basis points, as I'll give you uh, a definition, this is from Investopedia. But basis point refers to the common unit of measure of for interest rates and other percentages in finance. One basis point is equal to one hundredth of one percent or 0.01 percent. 
or 0 0.0001. So for example, if we go back and we look at the currency chart, and let's use Argentina as an example, we see dollars in foreign currency, which means for one dollar you get 36.7840. If it goes to 36.7842, it has moved two basis points. Now that would be good for me because if I can find a buyer to buy at the, the increased rate, then I make a profit by that differential. And if, uh, if I'm trading uh, large sums, then that differential is multiplied by the amount that I'm selling. And, and, and so many foreign currency traders make a fortune uh, by buying and selling currencies and looking for that tiny differential to, uh, so that they can earn these profits. The idea of currency conversion, I think we understand that, moving currencies from one market to the other. There's a very interesting video that I would like to, um, to show you at this point. There is a lot of information. This is one such video that will give you an idea of how foreign exchange rates work. And it's only uh, it's about five minutes, so we'll take a look. And hopefully this will give you uh, a deeper insight. Maybe you've traveled to Britain and exchanged your American dollars for British pounds. You may have wondered why you get less British pounds for each American dollar that you change. If so, you've experienced exchange rates in action. But do you understand how they work? You've probably heard the financial reporter on the nightly news say something like, the dollar fell against the yen today. But do you know what that means? In this video, we'll tell you what exchange rates are and explain some of the factors that can affect the value of currency in countries around the world. National currencies are vitally important to the way modern economies operate. They allow us to consistently express the value of an item across borders of countries, oceans, and cultures. We need exchange rates because we buy products and services in the seller's currency, whether that is due to travel tourism, investment, or foreign trade. The exchange rate is simply the cost of one form of currency and another form of currency. In other words, if you exchange one cis franc for 80 Japanese yen, you really just purchased a different form of money. There are various systems that determine a currency's exchange rate. Historically, governments entrusted the gold standard system as a way to formalize exchange rates. Under this system, all currency represented a real amount of gold held in a vault by that government. However, the system was flawed because countries needed to hold large gold reserves in order to keep up with the volatile nature of supply and demand for currency. Nowadays, there are three main systems used to determine a currency's exchange rate. The free-floating, fixed, and managed exchange rate systems. A free-floating exchange rate is set by the foreign exchange market through supply and demand for that particular currency relative to other currencies. In other words, a currency is worth whatever buyers are willing to pay for it and will be affected from day to day by changes in trade through exports and imports. Speculation and other factors such as price level, interest rates, and political situations in countries. For example, the exchange rate for the Chinese yuan will increase and you will get fewer yuan for your dollar if demand for the yuan increases because of greater demand, through imports for instance. For Chinese goods, simultaneously, the dollar will depreciate or fall in value as more dollars have been sold or supplied to the market. Generally, countries with mature, stable economic markets will use a floating system. Virtually every major nation uses this system, including the U.S., Canada, and Great Britain. Floating exchange rates are considered more efficient because the market will automatically correct the rate to reflect inflation and other economic forces. The floating system isn't perfect, though. If a country's economy suffers from instability, a floating system will discourage investment due to uncertainty about possible returns. Investors could fall victim to wild swings in the exchange rates as well as disastrous inflation. The alternative system is a pegged or fixed exchange rate system. This is where the exchange rate is set and artificially maintained by the government. The rate will be pegged to some other country's currency, usually the U.S. dollar, and will not fluctuate from day to day. A government has to work to keep their pegged rates stable. Their national bank must hold large reserves of foreign currency to mitigate changes in supply and demand. If a sudden demand for a currency were to drive up the exchange rate, the national bank would have to release enough of that currency into the market to meet the demand. They can also buy up currency if low demand is lowering exchange rates. 
Countries that have immature, potentially unstable economies usually use the PEG system. Developing nations can use the system to prevent out-of-control inflation to keep its products cheap and foreign products expensive, both of which are good for the balance of trade. This is why China has been criticized because it has kept its currency value artificially low in order to make exports cheaper and maintain a favorable trade balance. In reality, few exchange rate systems are 100% floating or 100% pegged. Countries using a pegged rate can avoid market panics and inflationary disasters by using a managed floating exchange rate. They peg their rate to the U.S. dollar, and that rate doesn't fluctuate from day to day. However, the government periodically reviews their peg and makes minor adjustments to keep it in line with the true market value. This is similar to the semi-fixed exchange rate system, which differs by the fact that the interest rate is permitted to move between bands of fluctuation, but is ultimately given a specific target, which is the dominant aim for economic policy making through interest rate. Floating systems aren't really left to the mercy of market forces either. Governments using floating exchange rates make changes to their national economic policy that can affect exchange rates directly or indirectly. Tax cuts, changes to the national interest rate, and import tariffs can all change the value of a nation's currency, even though the value technically floats. The next time you cross a border and trade your money for that of another country, remember that economic forces across the world help determine that exchange rate. In fact, when you exchange currencies, you're one of those economic forces. You're helping to set the exchange rate, too. Got a question that you want us to simply explain? Ask us in the comments. So as you can see, that, that was a very short video talking about the exchange rates and some of the mechanisms. Some of the terms used in the video were beyond the scope of this course. You would have to take international finance class uh, in order to better understand what they mean by these bands, which is kind of this uh, range uh, of allowable uh, rates for currency. And uh, certainly this is a more of a, uh, a, t a technical a technical subject when you start getting into derivatives. Um, but again, uh, you're just getting the, the basics here. There is actually another video which talks about how foreign exchange is related to you in terms of when you buy something at the store, let's say you buy something from Walmart, and those goods that you're buying are made in China, you are actually buying an import, obviously. Somewhere along the way, your dollar is being converted into the Chinese yuan and vice versa. There's an exchange that happens. Any of these foreign products coming in are considered imports, and there's an exchange that's made somewhere along the way. Even though we may not feel it, we may not see it, but we see the tags, we see the made in, rest assured that these uh, are issues that President Trump is dealing with uh, when, when he talks about tariffs and when he talks about uh, ensuring that uh, the U.S. is not exploited. This is what he's talking about. I'm not saying that he's going in the right direction in terms of his protectionism, but that's indeed what he is, he is trying to explain. I'll actually post that link so you can take a look at it if you'd like. As we move on, uh, currency hedging, I talked about the forward market, which you'll see in the video at the, the end of this uh, session. Currency arbitrage, uh, which is also in the book. That is the idea of taking currency from one market, buying it in one market, and selling it in the other. So if you go on page 229, they'll give you a better idea of what uh, currency arbitrage is. But it's a very straightforward idea in terms of what I mentioned, the differential that you're trying to get. Uh, and again, you'll see a live example of that in the video toward the end. I think we, by now, we should understand what depreciation and appreciation of, of currencies are. Uh, these are market driven and they're based on uh, market dynamics of supply and demand. Now, currencies increase in value and decrease in value, and it's essentially based on the confidence that the market has in that currency. If there is a low confidence, then those currencies don't move as much. They're actually dumped onto the market, and they don't move where they depreciate in value. 
And it's just like anything else. If you have a an, uh, an organism like the human body, blood has to continue to circulate. Otherwise, cells begin to die and then the organism dies along with it. So you have to keep the movement. And the way to keep the movement is to, to keep your economics flowing and have uh, a very strong um, pr productive system or production system so that you can produce goods that are in high demand by other by other entities. That's how you keep your currency strong and, and, and keep uh, keep your economy growing. What some countries do is they hold currency reserves. You have a country whose currency may be soft or not as convertible. They'll hold pounds, they'll hold dollars, yen, euros, Swiss francs in reserve, Australian dollars as well. They'll hold those currencies in reserves such that if they have a debt that they need to pay, they can use, they can dip into the reserves uh, if they have a, an immediate debt that they have to pay off. So depreciation, appreciation is market driven, whereas devaluation, revaluation is government imposed. You can adjust your the values of your currencies depending on how you want your uh, economics to play out. If the World Bank of, or if the IMF comes in and, and say you need to devalue your currency, what they're trying to do is they're trying to spur interest of outsiders to invest in your market to bring that capital in in exchange for uh, maybe access to cheaper uh, land, cheaper labor, and just, just a cheaper cost of doing business. Vehicle currency is what that chart on your right is using the US dollar as the vehicle currency because in the right column, you have those two columns or three columns. The left column is the, are the names of the countries. Then you have the second column, which is how much one unit of that foreign currency is equal to in US currency. And then the last column is how much one dollar is equal to in that foreign market. How much foreign currency can you get for one dollar? I, I believe we understand that now. But this currency is using the dollar as the vehicle currency in between two other uh, currencies that we decide to compare. The spot rate is any rate that you see on the chart. And these rates are... Uh, held for two days after an order. If you order some euros or if you order some uh, some Chilean pesos, and you place that order, that, that order sticks for two days until that transaction is completed. And then you have the cross rates that you calculated when you did the Jamaican problem. The Jamaican going to Japan, using the dollar as the vehicle currency, and then figuring out the, the cross rate in between the two. The forward rate, which is the uh, the British importer bringing in a million dollars worth of U.S. goods, they could wait for six months, they could pay immediately, or they can buy into a forward market. So if you go to page 233 at the bottom, you'll see foreign forward rates explained and also forward contracts. And I think that's uh, fairly easy to, to, to understand. So the direct and indirect quote in terms of quoting currencies, I'll just say this, that all of the currencies that you see are inversely related. So here, if you have 90 yen to $1, that is a quoted currency. Obviously, 90 is the yen, 1 is the US dollar. So it's 90 to 1. Now, that tells you how much $1 is equal to in yen. Now, how much is a yen equal to? 1 over 90. It's simply the inverse. And I was telling you about that 1 over X button. That 1 over X button would, would uh, come in handy about right now if you wanted to know how much 1 yen is equal to in U.S. currency. You put 90 in, you hit the 1 over X button, and then it gives you that amount. So again, these currencies, all currencies, are inversely related. 
when they're being converted or when they're being compared, they're inversely related. When one appreciates, the other depreciates. When one depreciates, the other appreciates. Okay, so I'm going to move on and, and do a couple of things, um, some exercises to show you a few things. These are things that I did in class, so it won't take that long. But this is a, a picture when I was in Vietnam in 2014. We were ac actually at a, uh, a security exchange uh, company. And we were, we were walking on the floor. These are other professors from other universities that were also on the trip. And I'm just holding up uh, currency notes that I uh, collected uh, while I was there. I, I think some of those are, were in my wallet as well. Uh, sometimes I carry around currency notes just in case I see someone, or especially if I see a, a, a small child. Uh, and let's say, for example, their parent, I get into a conversation with their parent, then sometimes I'll show them the currency notes, and usually children like to see things like that because um, they, they've never they've never seen foreign money before. So again, the dynamics, currency dynamics. I want you to make sure that you understand this idea of appreciation and depreciation. On the exam, you'll have some questions. Well, I have two quotes, and you'll have to tell me whether that currency appreciated or depreciated. Again, you can't just look at the number, that, that number, that the quoted currency, you just can't look at that. You got have to look at it in relationship to the other currency. So for example here, one US dollar is equal to 115.87 yen. In March, in May, the currency rate changes to one US dollar equals 117.23 yen. Has the yen appreciated or depreciated? Now I'm talking about the Japanese currency, the JPY. Just think about that for a minute. You have to look at that number in relationship to the dollar and in terms of what's being exchanged. In March, if you were paying for a dollar as a Japanese, you'd pay 115.87. In May, two months later, that same dollar now costs you 117.23, which means that your yen has depreciated in value because what? The dollar has appreciated. So remember the relative exchange. You're exchanging one currency for the other. In this case, the Japanese yen gets a bit weaker because it costs more to exchange for a dollar in May than it did in March. Here's another problem. I did this in class, uh, the uh, percentage change in the currency. And this is these, I used similar numbers here. If a currency rate changes from $1 equals 5 Ghanaian cities to $1 equals 4 Ghanaian cities, what is the percentage change in the dollar? So you can think about that for a while, and you can imagine if it changes from 1 to 5 to 1 to 4, that is, would not be good for the dollar, because you're getting less than you got before, which means that it has to be good for the Ghanaian, because they're inversely related. So how do you figure that out? Well, if you look in the book, they have this formula. And I'll give you the page number. I believe it's actually in the appendix. It, it used, it used to, to be part of the material that they would give you in the chapter, but they moved it to the appendix. So if you go to page 243, you'll see this formula. So that formula would be the new quote minus the old quote over the old quote. So what is the percentage change in the dollar? We already know that it's bad for us because we're getting less than we got before. So all you do is plug in the numbers, 4 minus 5 over 5. So we have the new minus the old over 
the old, which gives you negative 20, ne negative 0 0.0 or negative 20%. So the percentage change in the dollar is minus 20. The dollar has depreciated 20%. Make sure you understand this chart, including the graphs. If you look at the graphs here, you'll see the one on the left, one dollar in euros. In 2017, it was around one dollar equals 0 0.85. And in 2018, it is now 0.87. So what happened to the dollar? It increased in value as it relates to the euros. What happened to the euro? it decreased not just looking at the number but knowing that now you have to give up more euros per dollar than you did a year ago it's the same with the graph on the right hand side as it relates to the Japanese yen here is a foreign exchange I have case study it's not really a case study this was an article in black enterprise one that I read many years ago uh, and I would share it to, with my class and these were real live scenarios of uh, entrepreneurs who were involved in a foreign market they were they were entrepreneurs that actually made materials overseas uh, and then sold those finished goods into their domestic market so you have a uh, Harlan Brandon who was a uh, sold shoes he manufactured his shoes in Italy and then those products were shipped to the United States and the shoes were between 90 and 110 dollars but he realized that he um, was not making the margins that he needed to make because the euro kept getting stronger and stronger which meant that the dollar was getting weaker and weaker. So the, the amount of materials that he would buy were getting more expensive. So he said, I just couldn't continue. So what he did is he decided that because the euro went from 1 euro to 98 to now 1 euro to 116, strengthening over that period of time, According to this article, a year's time, uh, it, it went up quite a bit. So he decided that he was going to move manufacturing over to India, where the dollar was still strong, manufacture his goods there, and then send those to the U.S. Uh, for the U.S. market. This will look familiar because this is what you saw on the exam. The numbers, you want to make sure you have your your method uh, understood you're essentially taking an amount of money and you're converting it to another currency now when you do that you have to have what you have to have the exchange rate so typically it's an amount of money times the exchange rate now how do you determine uh, how to uh, use that exchange rate well, in this situation, you had exchange rates that were given. So to figure out how you calculate the 125, uh, how you convert 125 Jamaican dollars to U.S., you take 125 and you multiply it by that exchange rate. Now, you're actually converting two dollars, so that one goes on the top. And the 128 goes on the bottom. So 125 times 1 over 128 will give you the answer. And I believe that answer was $976.56. Now for the second half, you had 95,000 Jamaican dollars being converted into yen. Now here I give you two quotes, and some of you converted ninety-five thousand into Jamaican into ninety-five thousand Jamaican dollars, 
Some of you converted 95,000 Jamaican dollars into dollars first, and then you use the yen quote, which also works. And as a matter of fact, that might be more logical because I'm not sure if Jamaican dollars are convertible in, in the Japanese market. The Japanese may require you to have some other stronger currency that they can convert. But in this case, the cross rate would have been 112.28 over 128 because we're going two yen. We're trying to convert two yen. So that's two over from 112.28 over 128. Now, again, these two values are equal to a dollar. So this is how you're able to get the exchange rate between both of them. And here we're trying to determine how much one Jamaican dollar is equal to in Japan. If you know how much one is equal to, you know how much 95,000 Jamaican dollars are equal to. So that's how you're able to use the cross rate to get the target currency. This was your last question on the quiz. The scenario of the U.S. exporter selling $1 million worth of goods to an English importer in May. It is the responsibility of the, the English importer to use their pounds to get the million dollars to pay for the contract. That importer goes to the bank and gets a quote and they tell him that if you got those million dollars today, the exchange rate would be one pound for a dollar and 29 cents. You could either pay now or you can wait six months when the goods are due to arrive in the United Kingdom. You can also determine in the contract when the payment is going to be made, but it's up to the British importer to determine when they're going to get the million dollars ready uh, for, for payment. In this case, the British importer decides to wait six months, and at the end of six months, the pound has appreciated. So instead of a dollar twenty-nine, you go into the bank and they tell you now one pound is equal to one point two nine five, which might not seem like a lot, but let's do the math. What impact does the new rate have on the amount of pounds required to complete the transaction? So we have the two quotes here, the one in May and the one in November. The British trader bears risk exposure because of the time lapse and also because they are the ones exchanging the money. That's a key point. So they are the ones responsible for exchanging their pounds for that $1 million, thus they bear exchange exposure. So this is what happens. In May, the importer would pay the amount of 775,193.8 pounds. That would be if they paid for that contract or they paid for the million dollars to fulfill that contract in May, that's the amount of pounds it would have required. They decided that they were going to wait and the amount that, th that they required for the $1 million was 772,200.77. So they actually saved almost 3,000 pounds um, by waiting. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. The, the pound could have depreciated and they would have owed more. In order to protect yourself, that is when you engage in the forward market and lock in the rate of exchange and have your your dollars, your million dollars delivered to you in six months at a specified rate. All right, I'm going to move on to chapter 10. And the way I'm going to do chapter 10 is to show you the video that I mentioned to you uh, that discusses this idea of foreign exchange markets. It also gets into some of the topics in chapter 10, which is monetary policy, even give, it gives you a history lesson. And I think it will be very interesting to see uh, now that you've had some exposure to these some of these institutions, you, you can get an idea of how this system uh, was created. So I'm going to cue this up.
Every day, in trading rooms like this at Barclays Bank in New York, more than $200 billion of foreign currencies are bought and sold. Barclays is a major player in this 24-hour global market. This morning, chief foreign exchange dealer Jack Roche and senior dealer for sterling Steve Leipzig were monitoring their Tellerate screens when the Saudis announced an increase in oil prices. Sterling calls, please. There's oil news out. I'm going to buy sterling. I'm going to buy about 25 pounds, 60 or better. An increase in the price of oil could raise the value of the pound. Steve and Jack decide to buy 25 million pounds, speculating that the price will rise. Hello, my friend. Bob is New York. To disguise his strategy from the market, he instructs the traders of the other currencies to call out for prices. He buys his first five million pounds, then another, and with each wave of his hand, he will buy five million more. Take five. Fifty-nine, sixty-four. No, nothing. Sixty-three. Take five. Uh, you got five here. Take five. You got five here. Can I get those tickets real quick? Got five right here. In less than a minute, Steve has bought twenty-five million pounds. He waits to see how the market will react. Might see the dollar go a little bit lower than Where is it now? Got him more? A little higher. They have guessed right. The price of sterling begins to rise. I need a couple more calls, all right? You're a little busy. Okay. Okay. The pound has risen one tenth of a cent. Steve decides it's time to take his profit. He instructs his traders to find buyers. Nothing on 6570. Get higher ready now. Cable Joey. Steve also contacts an interbank broker to get bids. 66.71! Buyer calls begin to come in. 69.74! With two successive waves of the hand, he sells his first 10 million pounds. A New York broker has sold another 10 million pounds. The price has stopped rising. To preserve his profit, Steve must sell off his last 5 million quickly. With another call, the broker has found a buyer for his last 5 million. And he's out. Right. That's it. I'm out. I'm out. No, good. Thirty-two thousand. In less than three minutes, Barclays traders have made a profit of thirty-two thousand dollars, buying and selling fifty million pounds. This real-life transaction was an example of currency speculation one way in which international businesses can participate in the foreign exchange market. Other ways international business participate in the foreign exchange market are the facilitation of international trade and investment, and the investment of spare cash in short-term money market accounts abroad. Although these three avenues of participation in the foreign market offer international businesses vast opportunities, Adverse changes in the exchange rates can make seemingly profitable deals unprofitable, even disastrous. That's why, in today's global economy, it is absolutely critical that international businesses understand the influence of exchange rates on the profitability of trade and investment deals. The foreign exchange market is a market for converting the currency of one country into that of another country. This market has grown due to a shift away from a fixed world economy and an increase in global communications technology. I think it's fair to say that the new technology has linked the world into virtually a single efficient capital market. Uh, new instruments and further advances in the technology will probably enhance that capability even further and uh, mean that ultimately we're living in a world that's not only economically interdependent, but financially almost a single unit. Government economic policies used to be subject to a system of fixed exchange rates established at the World Monetary Conference at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. If a country's trade balance went into deficit, foreign central banks would demand gold in exchange for currency. If a nation remained in deficit too long, it would lose its gold and its ability to trade with other nations. 
but a fixed system not permitted to be responsive to the free market was vulnerable to periodic crises. These crises took the form of sudden devaluations. The British government today devalued the pound by 14.3%, not only rocking the international financial community, but sending interest rates in London up two full points in one day. The, devaluation the reverberations of the devaluation the echoed throughout the free world. Other nations whose economies were closely linked to Great Britain's devalued their currencies as well. The world of fixed exchange rates finally fell apart when the dollar itself, the backbone of the system, could no longer command the confidence of the international financial community. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserves. I was there at the time in the, in the government in 1970 and 71 when this thing became acute and we were considering even stronger measures such as uh, imposing quotas on imports from Japan in order to defend the dollar. So it was at that point that it was decided that rather than put the economy and the whole world economy through such a, uh, through such a ringer in order to avoid all these interferences with international trade and capital movements, the thing was just to do was just to let the dollar go down. I am determined that Nixon American called his action at the time a technical one possible. to stabilize the sinking dollar, but in fact he had lowered the curtain on the era of fixed exchange rates. Yet even amidst the turmoil of the currency crises, no one was certain that one era had ended and another just begun. In the 1960s, the uh, foreign exchange traders that I knew then relied awfully heavily for their information on the morning newspaper when they, came, <laughs> they read on the train on the way to work. And if uh, there were not uh, a currency crisis in Britain or France or someplace like that, uh, they might read, uh, th there would be a news ticker somewhere in their office that they might look at occasionally, but... Uh, there was no heavy demand for uh, information about where the market was because the price was fixed. The market was a totally different market. Uh, we did not trade uh, between banks here in New York. We only used to use brokers. We used to trade with our cor correspondents abroad uh, via telex machines. Uh, yeah, yeah. To make a direct phone call overseas, it used to take probably a half hour because you had to go through the operator. Uh, direct dialing did not exist. With technology today, you can buy $50 million in a matter of uh, 20 seconds. By early 1973, governments had lost the ability to set the price of their currency. With the majority of the money held in the market in private hands, central banks were no longer the force they were in the 60s. That power had shifted to the traders. I don't think anyone in the financial industry could have been sitting here 10 years ago and anticipated the dramatic changes that have occurred in technology, in deregulation, and in internationalization of financial markets. It has been a booming industry, not just booming financially, but in terms of innovations, in terms of new ideas and new techniques. As the foreign currency market has grown, it has also become more complex, creating a need for different exchange rates. Spot exchange rates are the standard rates at which a foreign exchange dealer converts one currency to another on a particular day. This rate is necessary to execute transactions immediately, but is not always the most favorable rate. A forward exchange rate is an exchange rate that governs future or long-term transactions. The rate locks in a rate of exchange for future use. This rate is agreed upon by both parties in the transaction and is based on expectations of what the market will do over the time period agreed upon. Another way to control rates of future transactions is by using a currency swap. A currency swap allows a business to simultaneously purchase and sell a given amount of foreign exchange for two different value dates. Currency swaps are used between international businesses and their banks, between banks, and between governments when it's desirable to move out of one currency into another for a limited period of time. Because large amounts of money and profit depend upon future exchange rates, it's imperative that international business understand the forces that determine these rates. 
Three things affect a country's long-run exchange rate movements. They are the growth in a country's money supply, the inflation rate of the country, and the nominal interest rates of that country. If any of these things are growing at a rapid rate, international business should take precautions when dealing with that country. While these factors have more of an impact on long-term rate exchanges, short-term movements may be due to other factors. Some of these are transportation costs, trade barriers such as tariffs, and psychological factors such as bandwagon effects among traders in the market. Besides the risk of future rates changing unfavorably for a business, there are other risks involved when dealing with the foreign exchange market. One such risk is that governments sometimes restrict currency convertibility, much like the Soviet Union had done in the past. One way businesses can cope with this problem is to engage in counter-trading. Counter-trading is a barter agreement between international businesses that involves the trading of goods and services for other goods and services. All of these factors are examples of how the foreign exchange market has grown more and more complex over the past 25 years. Modern technology, such as computers and satellites, have given rise to a volatile global marketplace where changes can occur instantaneously. Adverse changes in the market can have an overwhelming effect on international business deals, turning apparently profitable deals into highly unprofitable ones. Understanding the foreign exchange market is absolutely critical to the success of modern international business. By understanding the risks of the foreign exchange market and the different ways to protect against these risks, international businesses can not only survive but thrive in today's world economy.